please join me in welcoming Dr. Chen. Thank you, Leo. Uh, when Leo asked me to do this talk, he said it's just a really casual one at the end of the term, you know, that kind of so. Uh, just share about this course that you have been doing and just, just relax, okay? Uh, but I think that it's never a very relaxing thing when you stand up here and look at very intelligent guests and colleagues and students and friends here. So, uh, uh, I, but it's too late to, to feel sorry for myself now. But I will uh, try to share about um, this course that we have been doing. Uh, we just uh, ended last week, uh, the teaching part. Um, that we start on the world, of, uh, the history of Cantonese worlds. Uh, I think I would divide my talk into two main parts. The first part, of course, will be uh, the lecture, and then the second half will be uh, time opening the floor to listen to your comments and let's share and let's discuss. And I would define into three parts. Um, the planning of this course, why we, uh, as Leo was asking, why we had this course in the first place. Uh, the planning of it and how, how we came up with the syllabus and so on and so forth. The teaching of it, um, what kind of knowledge or what kind of things that I've learned through the teaching of it, uh, through interacting with students, uh, through their comments, through their uh, reaction, reflection, and also the future of such course. Uh, and that would take us maybe to farther than at least what I had in mind uh, in the beginning when I taught, uh, started teaching this course. But I will, uh, start from the beginning uh, to talk about the planning of the course. Now, um, the beginning, Leo was asking the question, but I think he has very much to do with the answer as well. Because it was more than about two years ago, he came to me and said, oh, let's have a drink, but ends up there's meaning behind a drink. Uh, he asked me, well, we had, I had this idea that you want to do this uh, Cantonese World's course, um, are you interested? I say, okay, what is the Cantonese world called? Well, you know, uh, it, it includes everything. Uh, anything is Cantonese related, uh, well, can, can go into this syllabus. And somehow the very optimistic me say yes to this idea <laughs> without knowing what I'm, I was walking into. Um, that's really the beginning of it. Um, I think his original idea is um, we, uh, as you just heard Leo saying, the Hong Kong study initiatives have a lot of different good courses on Hong Kong, on the Cantonese language, on Hong Kong music, uh, Hong Kong movies, and Hong Kong literature. Uh, but it seems like there'd be more uh, when it comes to Cantonese, because uh, when we think about the Cantonese words, it seems to be more than just the people from Guangdong or, or Canton. Uh, you can say, okay, those from uh, Guangdong, uh, you can call them Cantonese, but how about those who don't live in Guangdong or never been there? How about those uh, uh, who were born in Hong Kong or Macau? And if you ask them, uh, they may have, if they only give them a choice of whether you are Chinese or, or Mandarin speaking or Cantonese speaking, they probably pick Cantonese speaking. For them, you know, we are still Cantonese part of it. So even though they may have never visited the, the, the province of Guangdong, uh, something like that, oh, how about uh, families here? We have families here uh, that the, the kids may not even speak a word of Cantonese, or they may be able to understand some, they cannot write Chinese, but somehow they identify, oh, my family are Cantonese, you know, I'm from a Cantonese family. So do we exclude them? Do we count them? So it seems like there's a lot. So uh, when we think about the Cantonese world, we have to think, who should, why, uh, what should it be called? Um, what is it about? Is it about Cantonese language? Um, no, not just that, because as we said, those who may not be speaking or writing it can be called Cantonese. How about, is it uh, just Cantonese history? No, it, because it's still relevant, right? We're still looking at matters that um, we think is related to the Cantonese world. And what? Uh, geographical, no. Uh, it covers Hong Kong, Macau, Canton, Sydney, Australia, San Francisco, Vancouver, uh, Southeast Asia, all these different places. Now, it makes it very uh, interesting. I think at the end, um, Leo, uh, I think Leo was not certain about anything. 
but one thing. <laughs> the one thing he was certain he was quite adamant about was that this course should be called something about the Cantonese world. This is what I remember. So this uh, since then has been in my mind. So what constitute the Cantonese world? Uh, what should be included in it? Um, as far as what we have seen, I think it should be very encompassing. Uh, at the beginning, it should not be just limited to certain place, certain language group, certain period of history, or certain uh, uh, ethnicities. It uh, seems like uh, many people can identify with it. Um, I think the English word uh, was a little bit easier than the Chinese word. I, we actually had more trouble finding a translation for this course in Chinese. What is this called? Uh, is it a world of Cantonese, world of the Cantonese language, world of the Cantonese culture? It doesn't really work either way. Um, at the end, I think, I, I'm not sure whether I've made this official yet, but at the end, I think we come up with something close to Tong and Sai Gai. In Mandarin Tang and Shit, yeah, like the world of Tang people, uh, which is a very strange, odd name for this course. Given that Tang Dynasty ended many hundred, uh, more than thousand years ago, but there's a reason. Let me explain to you. When we use Tang Saiga, we count we calling one uh, very uh, distinctive, sudden characteristics of the Chinese people. Uh, as I, for example, when I look into the documents, and we find that uh, Tong Yan is actually what they would refer to themselves. So the sudden, for example, people from Guangdong at the in the 19th century, when they talk about who they're from, they usually not say China. They may say Zhongguo, Zhongguo, but more likely they say Tongsan. If they say who they are, they're very unlikely to say they're Honyan, or even less so with Zhongguan until later. They would say we are, we were, well, they would say we were, we are Tongyan. So this is what they are. And when we look back at, for example, the missionaries dictionaries that was written at that time, we had a, a number of them. And as early as 1828, uh, when you look at the Chinese definition, you already have it, Tongyan there. And this only definition there. So there's no Zhongguan, no Honyan, no Wayan. Only one definition. And when Robert Morrison was writing in Canton at that time, the only definition he could think of was Tongyan, because it's what he heard all the time. These people refer themselves as Tongyan. Later on, 1862, uh, you have uh, now China, Zhongguo is there, uh, the definition, but also with the Tongsan there. And Chinese will be Tongyan. And the language is not Zhongguo Hua, or Guangdong Hua, or, Can or, or Cantonese is Tonghua. It's very much that Tong image is very strong in there. Um, only until uh, in a work in 1882 that they have, uh, this work is both Cantonese and Chinese in general. So the author uh, uh, provides both uh, groups of terms. So you have Tongyan, Honyan, Zhongguan, Wayan. But then when you use Cantonese, Hai Tongyan, Ge, this very Cantonese phrase, they will use Tongyan. When it's a Mandarin phrase, Shi Huang that and they will use Hua Min, they will use a different term. So in his mind, it's very clear, somehow, this certain group of people, this Cantonese, these people from Canton, they will identify themselves with this idea part. And of course, it's more than just a word, because uh, for that, they also related to a construct identity that traced all the way back to the Tan Dynasty. Because during a time when there's a great migration from the North and South, and later on, there's always a dispute between the North and the South. They will always identify, well, we are from uh, the Central Plain back then. So we have preserved this culture and language that the Northerners did not have. So they would link, they, they would trace their lineage all the way back to Tanasi, some famous people. Uh, there's different uh, structures, uh, Lizia, things like that during the Ming Dynasty. They would uh, have in the ancestral hall, they would have uh, spiritual tablets that uh, to, to refer to some famous people in the Dantong Dynasty. So for them, they are not, they are, uh, they are uh, the, the, um, the offsprings of famous people or 
those who originate in the in the central plain as well. And later on, when there's a discussion about um, language, whether uh, Mandarin or the uh, the court language, lang Mandarin now is it the proper Chinese language or something the southern languages, Cantonese or the Minanghua, and it's always this. Uh, this concept coming up that uh, Cantonese come from this uh, mid-ancient Chinese that were used in the Central Plain and somehow we preserve some of the characteristics that is not shown in the northern, uh, the more uh, uh, influenced by the Manchurian and Mon Mongolian languages. So there's always this debate that we can go into, but at least they would think that they are different. They call themselves Hongyan. They say Tonghua, they preserve some form of uh, a concept or identity. And the same thing happened when they moved overseas. We know that lots of the, uh, many of the uh, immigrants or migrants from China who moved to, for example, the, the San Francisco area, Vancouver area, later on we we'll talk about that, most of them will be from the nowadays Guangdong area. And they would carry the idea to them when they gather uh, in this very hostile and racist environment. They form to get the group together. They try to support one another. They form this place, and they don't call this Zhong Boxing. They don't call it China. China. Oh, in English they call it Chinatown, but in Chinese it's called Tang Guy. It's a street of Tang Ren, street of the Tang people, and. Now Vancouver, the whole thing, uh, the whole area, Kiva, you know, Hastings, the this huge uh, Chinatown there. If you go to Richmond, the whole place is Chinatown. So like, so you don't have the idea of a street of the town people. But if you go to say Soho in London, and then you go there, you very clearly tell that street is the Tongan guy. That street is the Tongan street. Um, or in uh, Washington D.C., you have this huge arc that you go in there, you know, okay, I'm entering this Chinatown, I'm entering Hong Kong. So they had this idea and they carry this concept and terminology to the foreign land. So I think using this Tong Sai Gai, using this concept Hong Kong is pretty much a very good uh, representation of what the Southern is about. They are, you can say they are Chinese, but they feel different. They feel there's something more than just uh, ordinary or the rest of Chinese, they are, they have, in terms of history, in terms of linkage, in terms of languages, they are kind of different. And they carry that differences all over the world. Uh, so that's why I think if I have to pick a Chinese, uh, UBC has not asked me to pick a Chinese name, but if I am asked to, I will pick this name. So how to do it? Given their own many areas that we can look at, given that uh, it covers so many areas and time frames. So I really uh, try, at least in the preparation of this course, to go as wide as possible. And sometimes Leo would jokingly say, I don't know how you prepared for this course. And of course it's easy for him to say, he doesn't have to do it, right? Then I have to, and I have to start, uh, what I start is really from the beginning, from the uh, Baiyue uh, area. So it's, really the uh, spring and autumn period in China, when the sun was really, they would call the, the, the Central Plain people would be inhabited by, by the barbarians in the south of the south. So you have, uh, and the diamond stuff you have by here and then on the other side you have Minyue. Yeah. So it's really inhabited by different people and by modern days genetics, they're probably quite different from Han people. And in the, uh, according to the old text will be short hair and tattooed and not wearing clothes. And usually when you look at uh, the Han people, uh, the sign of that you are civilized is when you have proper manner. You have your hat, you have clothes on, you have long hair that tight, neatly tied, so you're very proper looking. And so if this guy go into the, that, uh, in the midst of them, we'll find them totally barbaric. And so we start from all the way back then to the Yue people uh, that probably not very related genetically to the Han people later on, uh, to later on when uh, this area slowly became part of China. Uh, even though it slowly became part of China, it was always had this idea of a far south. Uh, when it comes to China, south is, does not mean Guangdong, at least in the past. 
South is always south of Changjiang, south of the Long River. So Jiannan, Jiannan is referring to places like nowadays Hangzhou and Suzhou, those places, not all the way, all the way down to Fujian or uh, Guangdong, Guangxi. So those are not the places, those are far south. Uh, in, in time of Song, it's called a place of poisonous gas. So if you excel me, go there, I'll probably die. And they write letters to the emperor, say, please send me back, otherwise I'll die from inhaling this poisonous gas. <laughs> so it's a very exaggerated depiction of the area. Uh, this is Tang, but when we look closely, uh, we find that oh, things are different. Now, uh, what one of another purpose of this course is we want to really see things through the lens of the Cantonese world. We are very uh, uh, accustomed to seeing China history through the eyes of China historians or Chinese historians. When we think about trade, most likely we think about trade with the West through the Silk Road and riding camels and trading stuff like that. But if we start really forcing ourselves and focusing our, our, our eyesight on the South, we find that no, they have a totally different and equally flourishing and probably more long-lasting trade going on in the South. It's usually called Nanhai, South, which is a South uh, Ocean trade. And when all the, uh, uh, India was a major partner, the Arab uh, countries were major partners, and also went all the way to Madagascar. Uh, during the time of Tang. So uh, the center of Guang, so at that time probably just called uh, Pan Yu, Pun Yu, uh, still uh, would be a, a central or Nanhai, uh, would be a very important trade part. And nowadays we find lots of, uh, 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 well, not lots, we have with evidence about this trade going on. So when we focus on the south, we find actually there's a lot we've been missing and that we haven't been looking. But either way, if we only look at what the officials written in Song, we thought that that area is still uninhabited. Lots of forests and mosquitoes, uh, tropical diseases uh, infested area. But no, during that time already you have Arabs, you have foreigners living in the present day Guangzhou and they be stationing their, their rules to help them. So in the far south, when uh, the central thing of the north still feel a bit uneasy about them. These people already engaged in cultural interaction. They were able to meet with a lot of people, interact with them. Uh, we don't even know how they did translation and interpretation back then. Uh, but one of the interesting things about one study is that, oh, how about a ship? If I have a ship of sailors that uh, make up of Chinese or Cantonese, uh, make up of uh, Arabs and Indians. What language should I be using? <laughs> it was a very good question, not English for sure, right? <laughs> what language? And they say that, well, uh, people use Hokkien. One of the theories is that because it's one of the, the, the language they've been using when they travel around the area. So very interesting uh, indeed. And so this course took us from uh, by your time, the Yue people to the Tang Dynasty, and then, of course, to the Canton system during the main and the late main and early Qing, oh, well, basically late main, kind of extended to, to the late Qing area. And this is the picture, of course, of the 13 factories, the Subsam Hong, where all the foreign uh, countries set up their headquarters there, and we have all these uh, interesting terms that we start coming in Daiban, and also Comprado, and Hopo. And those terms came in because there's a flourishing trade uh, that happening in, the, uh, in Canton at that time. Um, the foreigners would reside in Macau. Uh, so this is really an area that Macau and Canton start to become a very important hub of interaction and international trade activities. And then we, we talked about the immigrants from especially from the nowadays Guangdong area to Southeast Asia. Um, and of course later on we talk about those coming over here to North America. In this picture it will be from Vancouver, uh, how they would, uh, what kind of things that they experience over here. And then we shift back to our attention. So we already covered about uh, 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 just more than a thousand years okay, already uh, by, by the middle of the term. And then we switch to the Canto Pop 
uh, a bit earlier about the rise of Hong Kong, about how Hong Kong uh, really became an international metropolitan because of all the immigration happened in the end of uh, 1940s. And between 1949 and 1952, basically increased uh, four times its population. Um, and then the Cantopop, the Cantopop influence, um, and overseas, if those of you have immigrated here long enough, you probably recognize this, you have to be here long enough and old enough, okay? So young people among you probably don't recognize this. This is the old Aberdeen Center. Where you go in there, you go three stairs up, you will see a movie theater. You can buy Hong Kong popcorn there. If you turn left, you will be the bowling alley. Upstairs will be top and restaurant. So those of you may remember those days, but a lot of uh, Cantonese, not only uh, because of the, the 1997, many of them moved overseas. Uh, we can really call it the second wave uh, of Cantonese uh, massive migration to places like Vancouver, Sydney, and, and the States, and Toronto. And then finally, uh, we talk about uh, the, the rise of China, how it influenced the, the Cantonese world, uh, not just in Hong Kong, but elsewhere. And this is actually a very Vancouver uh, a local production of ultra-rich Asian girls, you know. And we talk to the students about what kind of a culture Shaw is presenting to Vancouverites. And I remind them that when the Cantonese first came, or the bulk of them came in the 80s, we were called the Forbes. We were called the Fresh Off Boats. <laughs> uh, and we very experienced uh, uh, debate about spending, debate about luxury cars, expensive cars, big houses, trees cutting. And now it's uh, another set of, kind of cultural uh, shock to the people in Vancouver. But as you can see, uh, we cover a lot of ground, uh, a lot of geographical area, uh, areas, uh, a huge span of time, and also a lot of different topics. Uh, of course, one uh, disadvantage is we cannot go very deep down on uh, each one of them. But I think the students have been doing quite fine. At least um, all of them are still breathing and still, <laughs> some of them are still here, so are uh, here. So uh, they, they, they are okay, they are handling quite well. Um, has been a very steep learning curve for myself, um, but uh, as Leo said, I, I am very, um, always see myself a jack of all trades, so I just kind of play to my, my game as well. But this is the planning of it. Um, the teaching of the course. I've learned a lot during the teaching of the course. Uh, I was asked to do a survey of where my students came from. You know, are they from Earth or Mars? Um, I just so I asked one day, I asked, okay, put up your hands if you're from Asian studies. And I was expecting about 90 or 80 or 70% of them putting their hands up. Turns out, just maybe four, five. <laughs> maybe they were shy, but, uh, but as I asked on, I find that that's Really, I start going through, is it, are you from history? Are you from the languages programs? Are you from arts? And still a lot of people not putting up their hands. And then I start asking some of them from commerce, some of them from science, and some of them from a lot of different, different departments. And I was quite surprised by the finding. And why would they want to take such a course? Uh, and and I asked them, did someone pay you off or what happened? Where did you see, what kind of things did you see that wants you? Because the department, of course, they want them to uh, have a way of knowing how to promote a next course or the, uh, a new course, right? So uh, I want to find out how they find out. And it turns out they just search. They search, the keyword was Cantonese. And they find the keywords Cantonese, and Cantonese was quite interesting. Uh, this guy, he can't find me on the ring, my professor, so he can't see how bad I am. <laughs> so this well, is probably um, uh, not, not lethal, so let's, let's take his course, okay? This is, this is what happened. Um, it's very interesting. Um, I would call it the Cantonese War Showed Up. I'm not sure if you remember this movie, Forrest Gump. Remember Forrest Gump and uh, Lieutenant Dan? Uh, Lieutenant Dan was the guy who lost his legs, right? and he was always cursing God, you know? And one day they were on the sea sailing and there's a big, uh, Lieutenant Dan was like making fun, ridiculing God again. 
and then this huge storm came up. And I remember in the movie, Forrest Gump said, well, God showed up, right? <laughs> so uh, I think the Cantonese world showed up. I thought about, let's spread it. Let's just include a lot of different things. And turns out my students are from everywhere. That diversity is not limited to just how I design the course. That diversity is reflected in the, the way that students tell me how they learn about this course and how, how they relate it to Cantonese world. Uh, some of them have grandparents, uh, uh, grandfather paying had taxes and coming here, not able to bring the family over, had to leave the family behind and marry again. And so they are com complicated. And some had the parents uh, being refugees who went to Hong Kong. Some, one of them even said they swam. His dad swam to Hong Kong. And when he settled down in Hong Kong and moved to Canada during the 80s and 90s, some of them were from Hong Kong overseas students. Some uh, are uh, from Canton, the Cantonese from Guangzhou. And some of them don't even speak Cantonese. It's just a lot of different, um, it's just a lot of different students who are interested in this topic. Some of them, uh, uh, one interesting one is his dad, his grandfather was a, uh, a local leader of the Kowloon city. So they have they was in the Kowloon city doing all these students and running things on their own. So he said, wow, I said, well, it's very interesting. I would encourage them, there's a project that I would, Ask them to do a uh, library research, library project. And I encourage them, well, you can uh, find some primary sources and secondary sources. If you find some very good uh, people to interview, I'll consider this primary source. And they actually, some of them, they did. And they need interpreters, which is usually their parents. So, so they took their parent, grandparents out for dim sum and then start asking questions, but they couldn't understand or couldn't ask. So often the mom and dad is next to them just do interpretation. But they find out a lot. They find out a lot about their families. Uh, they find out a lot about their history. They find out a lot about how they came to Canada. And they find out a lot about the persons as well. What the parents went through, what the grandparents went through. I think probably not a few of them probably had a bad relationship with their grandparents now after all this dim sum and talking, right? So it has been very interesting. Uh, I really think the candidates will show up. So it's really hard for me to pinpoint certain people, but all of them are related to the Cantonese world. But another problem I have in the course of teaching and preparing is that more and more I find that this Cantonese label is really hard to take hold of. Now it's very easy to say, oh, we're talking about this course on Cantonese words and Cantonese language. We have this Cantonese even writing that we can do, uh, we, can, we can write, the characters that we can use in our language, vernacular writing. But what is Cantonese? Uh, it's like back to the world of Cantonese words. We find that this Cantonese label, this, this identity, this cultural identity, didn't come until very late, very late. Because when I was teaching them about Guangdong, well, it's very simple. Those who in in Guangdong and Canton will speak Cantonese, right? But they actually not. Uh, if you look at them, they were now this is area. This is where Guangzhou is. Uh, this area, you can kind of say that they are speaking the uh, Guangfu, uh, you know, the 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 Guangzhou Cantonese. You can kind of say that. But even if you go a little bit off to the say yeah to the four counties area, you find that the 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 accents are different, the dialects are different, the terminologies are different as well. I remember one year I went to Portland and I did some uh, church thing and we visited uh, an old lady which is from from Yanping, which is where my hometown is supposed to be, even though I've never been there. Um, he was talking about and I find I can kind of understood uh, 60, 70 percent of that, but some that I couldn't understand. Some of the terms are very different. For example, the you know, telephone. They don't call it the Nwa, they call it Han Xin, you know. The shouting line, you know. They have their own different words to describe things. So even just slightly off to here, you're already different. And then along, if you go to the more mountains area here, the uh, Meizhou, Huizhou area, they all the hacker people here. They speak hacker. And I was just talking to a friend last week. He told me that what even 
given Hong Kong is so strongly Cantonese speaking, you still have areas you have uh, that they have very strong with the Hakka uh, identities, with the culture, go together. He said he would still go there, they would still speak Hakka uh, language. So, and of course you have Chiu Zhao. Um, you have over here, you have a Chiu Zhao, which uh, very interestingly, the language is more related to the Minan language than the Cantonese. So uh, it's a language you probably cannot understand if they speak too quickly or if you totally don't have any writing uh, to refer to. So even within Guangdong, you have three major language groups. And what happened is that when they moved to different areas to carry their identity, so it's not like, oh, well, we moved to Malaysia, so we become Cantonese living in Malaysia. No, they don't call them that. They would be like Cantonese or Guangfu people living in Malaysia, or Hakka or Hakka people living in Taiwan, or Hokkien living in the Philippines. And you find in Southeast Asia, that's what happened. In a country like Malaysia, you have places that speak a certain so-called Cantonese language and not the other. For example, Kuala Lumpur, most is Cantonese speaking. Ipo as well. But if you go to the Philippines, they will be Hokkien. Uh, you have different languages uh, in different areas. So would they consider themselves Cantonese? We're not sure. Would they consider themselves Taozhou more than Cantonese? We're not too sure. Now this is one thing. And the same thing with North America or Sydney. When they move, now this is a very a small diagram that tells you where uh, it is. Now, the, really the Hong Kong Cantonese that we, uh, for some of those who Hong Kong have been speaking, they're really influenced by the Guangzhou Cantonese. Uh, so this area, they sound similar. Uh, influencing Hong Kong and Macau. Slightly up will be the Seyap area, the four counties. Now it's Mnyap, they add one more. Basically, Toisan, San Wei, Yanping, Hoi Ping. And why is it important? Because during the turn of the century, turn of the from 19th to 20th century, most of the immigrants came from these, basically, these five counties. Uh, most of them from uh, uh, Seiya, and by the most of them from Toisan. How many? From the survey from 1885 uh, to 1946. Uh, found that 50%, close to 50% are from just Toisan alone. And to get us, say, up, add to get us close to 80%. And then another maybe six or seven from, uh, from uh, Zhongshan. So together, this small area made up of 80 something percent of all the Chinese immigrants arriving. In, in North America uh, during that time. Um, according to some people, when I'm not as old, okay, according to some even older people, <laughs> they say they used to go to Chinatown and they would uh, be able to get a better deal if they, they spoke uh, a, a dialect. If they use, you know, uh, to order food, they would they would get you know, another tongue or something, or, or they would get a little bit more than, than they bargained for, they asked for. So uh, still very uh, uh, so no Cantonese was not a, a, the norm back then, was not the major language back then. So when is Cantonese happening? Why are we always saying Cantonese this and that? And when we pay attention to it, we find that even Hong Kong, it was a process. Hong Kong, in the, as I was mentioning, from 49 to 52, the population went from uh, something 600,000 to 2.2 million in a few years. And many of those people were from the north. They were not native Cantonese speakers. And so it was a long time in Hong Kong happening. Their identity was different. They would not identify, they even wouldn't identify themselves as Hong Kong people. They call themselves maybe I don't know, uh, you know, uh, Hakka person, uh, uh, Tzu person, or more importantly, they will be KMT supporters or the CCP supporters. That's why all this uh, this term about China politics in Hong Kong because they would um, find an excuse to fight each other, such uh, so as the Kowloon riots and the '67 riots. They're all related to China politics. So this 
homogeneous or this singular Cantonese uh, identity did not happen until very late. Probably after 67 when the television culture came on, when they had one language that they would watch day and night, and when they have a second generation growing up speaking this form of Hong Kong Cantonese, that by the 70s and the 80s, they finally have that influence. And because, that, because of the growth of the rise of Hong Kong and the popularity of Canton Pop, that got transferred to all of the world exported. So now we have this similar, seemingly very uh, consistent, coherent Cantonese culture actually has a very late happening. Uh, so when I was looking at it, I find I cannot just keep uh, paying attention. And I remember one thing that Henry uh, was saying uh, when I, before I taught this course, he was talking to me one day. He said, uh, well, sometimes whenever we talk about Cantonese, we think it's Hong Kong. But this is very uh, wrong. Well, no, this is not true because, uh, yes, Hong Kong became very important in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but there has been Cantonese people all over the world. Things have been going on a lot. We just happen to be focusing on Hong Kong. So, and also reminds me, I'm not sure if you have, uh, in the past, in the 80s and 90s, Hong Kong often had this beauty contest. Uh, the beauty contest, all these ladies uh, would go have this beauty contest in Hong Kong. If you have uh, watched some of this, you find them sometimes quite disturbing. Probably not in that, at that time, but now you think about it, it's kind of disturbing. They would have uh, uh, questions for this, this, these ladies, okay? Some of them were not even Cantonese speakers, or they would speak with a very strong accent, uh, uh, Cantonese. Uh, but they would make fun of them. <laughs> they would make fun of the Cantonese. So making fun of the, uh, the, the Mandarin-speaking ladies, Cantonese, has become part of the fun of the joke of those contests. Uh, it's very un improper if you have an English-speaking contest now here and they start, speak, start making fun of you if you have a Italian -like accent or something, right? But back then, uh, it was so strong that we would. And I remember there are people who... Uh, uh, recently, there are people who call for let's not laugh at people when they speak Cantonese uh, because it's very easy, because it's such a hard language to master and very hard language to really speak the way, for example, Hong Kong people speak. Because even if you're from the other counties, they already have their own accent, right? So this has been this urge to ask people not to make fun because you want to encourage more people to speak it. And when you think about it, it's very true because Hong Kong Canton is just one type. It's just one part within this whole world. Uh, people from Guang, Guangdong who already speak kind of different Cantonese, uh, use different words. So it's nothing to be feel arrogant about. And I think so at the end, I think uh, it's one thing that really helped me to think about this Cantonese world is it's not, it's just not, uh, it's a lot more than Hong Kong. And I remember this, uh, when I was doing an interview, this, uh, this, well, this person doing the, conducting the interview asked me, he said, why are we doing the course of Cantonese world uh, overseas in Vancouver? He asked it in a nice way, but he was just wondering, how come is, uh, we're doing it here in Vancouver? And I explained to them, because that's exactly why we have to see it. Uh, we expect to see a course on Cantonese wars in Hong Kong, in Macau, or even in Guangdong. But it is a lot more than that. When we do it in overseas, we add to this, this whole concept of Cantonese wars. We bring in new perspectives. We bring in new ideas. We see things differently. And uh, sometimes we can pull ourselves back and contribute to the whole debate and narrative. So I think it's very, it's actually very good because if you do Cantonese wars in Hong Kong, you probably don't, will be missing all the things happening overseas. It's only when you do it overseas, you would try to be embracing, encompassing, and include all the other things. Finally, the future of this course. I have 15 minutes left and finally uh, reached the point that I'm trying to answer why Cantonese words matter this question, okay. 
And I'm only saying I'm trying, okay, I may not be able to put an answer to this. But how about the future? Uh, what is in store for us for this course? Now, first of all, I think I find lots of growing interest and attention of this course. Um, the first, uh, I've been doing quite a number of uh, interviews, uh, media in other places as well. I think the first one was, uh, was because of Leo. Leo kind of banned William Ho's arms to ask Fairchild to give me an interview. So they reluctantly agreed, and that's uh, my, this is the whole page is my self-promotional page, okay, you can ignore, but this is me at the Fairchild uh, interview. Uh, after that, um, they, there's a lot of different interviews because people start talking about oh, what, what, the first question is why is Cantonese world, what is the Cantonese world, why are you doing it, how come, can you find students? Are the students interested about this course at all, you know? Are you doing it in Chinese? No? Cantonese? No? In English? Who would come? You know? Things like that. All these questions, lingering questions. So I did this and also had an interview with the Singtao. Uh, they, sorry, all, all my pictures there, okay, for now. Um, and then I did an interview for Omni News. Um, all these were uh, really certain they heard about this and they, and they came. Um, I also received emails about uh, from non-UBC students asking about this course, and this is true. I didn't make it up. Okay, uh, just today I just asked this students on co-op somehow heard about this course. It wrote to me and said, uh, "Clem, I know you're a visiting professor. I think he wants to ask, are you going to be fired or will you will you stay?" He's just asking. But since you're a visiting professor, I'm not sure. Are you going to stay and teach this course next year? Because I want to take it. Because I'm on co-op, I'll come back in September 2009. Total truth, okay? I didn't make this up. Um, and I, I haven't replied him, but I'm going to reply, I don't know. But we'll see. But we'll, most likely the course will continue. As we said, we have 50 students this term and all survived. Um, so no one, no one died. And so I think it's a good sign. And people have been calling and writing and talking about uh, this. Uh, it has been a lot of interest. Um, I think another um, Another interest is about uh, UBC, it's related to UBC, because um, as you can see from the promotional materials I quote from the Hong Kong Economic Journal, uh, they use the term Yusat Kao Yu Ye. So when Cantonese lost, uh, no, Yusat Kao Yu Ga. So when Cantonese is lost, you resort to Canada. Uh, this has been the concept uh, because I think uh, Hong Kong, uh, UBC and the Hong Kong Studies Initiative did a good job, great job of starting Cantonese programs. Uh, has been a lot of report about this. We start this Cantonese language program and then we add it up with Hong Kong literature, Hong Kong movies. Uh, so it has, it has helped UBC to build a reputation of a prestigious Canadian university that care about Cantonese, care about Hong Kong study. So when this course came out, I think this add to that, uh, that article suspicious specific talk about this course, then UBC has this idea to try to bring, talk about, uh, uh, to discuss, to study, to bring uh, academics, to bring scholars together and try to find out ways to uh, learn more about. And because uh, the attention is there, the interest is there, but also the, uh, uh, we had a priority on this. Um, it's not just one of the Chinese languages, but we believe there's more than just that. There's a great value in your studying Cantonese and Hong Kong. Um, but sometimes this is a misconception uh, because while we're doing all these Cantonese courses, we also rejected the Confucius Institute for four times. So some of them, uh, as I've heard, that they even want UBC to be you know, holding up the banner of Cantonese and push against the rise of the, 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 the China or Mandarin speaking world. Uh, so maybe a bit of, uh, of a misconception because I, I showed this, picture, uh, this video to my students last week on uh, Ross, uh, who's a uh, uh, department head. I was was talking about why uh, the UBC rejected the Confucius Institute for at least three of the account. And every time there's some reason, okay? It's not just that you, because we don't like Mandarin, no, it's not true, okay? Because Ken, UBC has a very strong Mandarin program as well. So it's not about the language, nor about uh, Chinese culture that we don't like. Asian studies have courses on Chinese history, literature, 
uh, culture, religions. So it's not about uh, favoring Cantonese over Mandarin. It just happens that uh, all these proposals were not accepted by UBC. And that, but the fact remains that um, the Cantonese world uh, or can, the study of Hong Kong and Cantonese is a major focus of the department. And very uh, fortunate that the department has been supporting and uh, with the leadership, Leo has been doing a great job. Um, when I was doing this course, when I was thinking about the future, when I was hearing all these people giving feedback, um, I think um, I, for myself, I have a bit more than what I expected in the beginning. When I first started teaching the course, my my view uh, was to teach our students all these interesting things about the Cantonese world. History, culture, language differences, uh, teaching English, teaching uh, Portuguese, uh, you know, Canto Pop, Hong Kong television shows, uh, things like that. All these interesting things which I would like to share with my students. That's what I began. But as I start looking more, I think there's perhaps more than that. Maybe I'm thinking too much, but I'd like to share with you, and then you can respond to me today. First of all, I think, can this be a new field of study? Uh, just like any sensible teachers would do, when you first start a course that you haven't taught, what's the first thing you do? You go online, you open up Google, you pick the course, and see where you can find a syllabus that's very similar, that you can base upon. <laughs> Maybe just me, okay? <laughs> Chris and Leo Hornot don't do that, okay? But me, that's what I do. I see, what, see whether I can find a syllabus that you know, similar to what I'm trying to teach, and then I'll try to come up. And what I found is I could not find a Cantonese world syllabus, syllabi anywhere. So it turns out to be quite new, this course, and this whole concept that trying to uh, see the world and see China through the lens of the Cantonese world. Very new concept. And that makes me want to do more. And I think because thanks to the course, it also creates some uh, excitement around the world. I'm just invited by uh, the Education University of Hong Kong. They had a conference next year on Cantonese in May. And I've been invited to give a talk uh, specifically on Cantonese world. They want to know what are you talking about Cantonese? What is it about? Why do you want to do this? How does it bring to this whole reservoir of studies that we have when it comes to both? So I think it's mostly linguistic in nature, that conference, but they want to bring in other topics. Um, another thing that um, it has been, what I've been working on is that I've been talking to Asian, uh, the Association of Asian Studies. Um, I proposed to them, can we turn this course materials into a new book. And I've been trying to ask them to about uh, not pop out, uh, publish as one of the Asian shorts series of the AAS. And so far, uh, the confirmation is not 100%, but so far I've been getting really good responses. So maybe the confirmation will come through soon. So hopefully, I, what I want to do is I want to put this together. This would be very uh, low level, simple, but it's not very high and the academic scholarly work. I just want to put together what I've been sharing and what I've been learning from the students into this work, it's like a starting point. So those who would like to know more about Cantonese work can read, and even those who want to maybe start courses or programs on Cantonese work can base upon this. So we kind of really treading on this virgin land, um, the new ground that seems to be wide open and seems to have interest from different parties. So this is what I have in mind. Hopefully, uh, we'll see in the next uh, year or so, in a few years, see whether there's a life after the course that we can actually expand this and allow or invite more people to pay attention to the topic of Cantonese worlds. My second thing is maybe even more um, ambitious. I was in Hong Kong University last year uh, sharing with them. Um, my topic was on uh, 67 riots and one of the papers I wrote 
Um, I talk to the young people in Hong Kong University. I find, uh, you probably know about this, you find this sense of hopelessness in Hong Kong right now, especially among young people. And they ask questions about, because I told them, well, at least in the 67, after all this rise and fighting, afterwards, they decide we should not be looking at China politics. No more KMT over against CCP, no more leftists and rightists. Let's focus just on livelihood and build Hong Kong up. So uh, within two decades, they had a very good success with Hong Kong society. And one of the students said, well, they are possible back then. Back then, they could work hard and have a chance to succeed. Now, even if we work hard, we can't. We're only going to live in this 120 feet square place. Uh, there's no hope in the future. Don't see any hope in the politics. Don't see any hope in getting a place to, to live. Don't see any hope. There's just this sense of hopelessness. Uh, there's a reason for well, last year's uh, statistics about Hong Kong people's identification as as Chinese, uh, uh, they asked them, uh, do you identify yourself as Chinese? And it was the last one I looked at, June uh, 2017. Uh, the figures have been going down since 2008. As soon as the Olympics over, as soon as the economic uh, downturn happened, the identification percentage kept going down. That's been going down. You know how many percentage of young people like 19, uh, actually, I think 15 to 29, that identify themselves as Chinese over Hong Kong? 4%. 4% of them would identify themselves as Chinese. Uh, so the situation has been very bad. And among my students, there are students, uh, overseas students from Hong Kong been talking to me. And I suddenly have this idea. Now, the realization of Cantonese worlds, not only is the understanding of how big Cantonese worlds is, can it be an actual thing? <laughs> Sorry, I took, let me put it together. Uh, they feel the hopelessness in this situation in Hong Kong. There seems to be no way out. And that's why they've been trying to look at overseas. But the world is huge. So what is happening in Hong Kong is just one area. But there's a lot more going on in the Cantonese world besides Hong Kong. Will that kind of collective strength create new for future for the Cantonese world? Would studies be done outside of Hong Kong, outside of Guangdong, even though the language may be issue, maybe uh, they feel that all oh, the government is trying to stop us from speaking Cantonese. We can only do Mandarin now. All the kids would watch Mandarin uh, programs already. They already start stop talking, speaking Cantonese. But can we create a bigger Cantonese world? May not be so totally language dependent. Maybe we look more at can the overseas Cantonese world contribute? We can have second generation, third generation. Children of Cantonese families, they can have their own contribution to what they mean by Cantonese. What they mean by Cantonese surviving or living in Vancouver, in San Francisco, in Sydney. How about Southeast Asia? Just recently there's this, uh, this, this pop artist from Malaysia, he was doing this medley of Hong Kong pop songs. And Hong Kong people are all excited because they find someone still cares about the old Canto Pop, even though he's from Malaysia. So, is the realization of Cantonese was just limited to the, to the mental level? Can it be something bigger? Can we encourage? By opening up, by not just looking at really hugely populated areas like Hong Kong, Guangzhou, uh, everywhere. By this collective strength, would that be a chance to preserve or even forward Cantonese culture, Cantonese languages, Cantonese concepts. So uh, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm already 20 years ahead of myself of this lecture, okay? But I'm just, after I taught this, after I finished lecturing, after speaking to students, I started having this idea. And it's not something that I can do uh, or any one people, person can do, but hopefully it's something that we can bring out um, 
We never know. Maybe this idea of quantum mechanics was more than we had perceived before. Would help. We have the culture. We have the language. We have the concepts. We have the people. I think my time is up. Thank you.